Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today I was finishing up a piece that I've been working on for a few weeks now. It's centered on an event that occurred during the Peninsula Campaign in Virginia in 1862. In wrapping up the piece, I went to George B. McClellan's book titled McClellan's Own Story, published in the late 1880s, to get some of his views on the campaign. He was the commander of the Army of the Potomac, and I wanted to dot a couple of I's and cross a couple T's. And I got caught up in his book. Uh, I got sidetracked, actually, went down the research rabbit hole when I found out uh, about what he had to say about uh, President Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton. You students of the Civil War know about the tension, the adversarial relationship that McClellan had with Lincoln and with McClellan. It's definitely the stuff of legend. Uh, McClellan, his, he was young. He was charismatic. He was brash. Eastern guy, career military, had it all going for him. He was also had an ego a huge ego and um, instantly rubbed elbows the wrong way with Lincoln. Lincoln, of course, the homespun Westerner attorney, brilliant coming at this through coming at life through homespun anecdotes, just sort of oil and water. And of course, Stanton is his own man. He's in it for all kinds of reasons. He can be your best friend. He can be your worst enemy. So the three of them together, it did not go well, which explains McClellan's early exit from the Army of the Potomac, not too terribly long after the Battle of Antietam, which ended the Maryland campaign, something of a draw. And of course, the bloodiest military day in U.S. history. So in going through McClellan's book, it's a bit of a tough read because that ego is constantly there and these passive aggressive attacks on Lincoln and McClellan. And I thought, oh gosh, I should share these with you just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to begin with his comments about Stanton. These are two passages that I'm putting together and I've got the link here in the comments field so you can dig into the book and read it for yourself to get the complete context. But I want to give you these first two passages about Stanton. So here we go, from McClellan's own story. I had never seen Mr. Stanton and probably had not even heard of him before reaching Washington in 1861. Not many weeks after arriving, I was introduced to him as a safe advisor on legal points. From that moment on, he did his best to ingratiate himself with me and professed the warmest friendship and devotion. I'll stop here for a minute just to say that Stanton at this point is in Washington and he's a lawyer. He's not yet the Secretary of War. So McClellan continues, I had no reason to suspect his sincerity and therefore believed him to be what he professed. The most disagreeable thing about him was the extreme virulence with which he abused the president, the administration, and the Republican Party. He carried this to such an extent that I was often shocked by it. He never spoke of the president in any other way than as the original gorilla and often said that Du Chalou was a fool to wander all the way to Africa in search of what he could so easily have found at Springfield, Illinois. I'm going to pause here for another moment. If you're wondering about Du Chalou, he's talking about Paul Du Chalou, who was a popular American hunter and explorer in the late 1850s. That name is completely lost today, I, for the most part. Um, I'm not familiar with him, so I had to even look him up. Uh, but there he is. So continuing on, nothing could be more bitter than his words and manner always were when speaking of the administration and the Republican Party. He never gave them credit for honesty or patriotism and very seldom for any ability. Now, here's the second 
passage, McClellan, now dealing with Stanton after he becomes Secretary of War. So here we go. Soon after Mr. Stanton became Secretary of War, it became clear that, without any reason known to me, our relations had completely changed. Instead of using his new position to assist me, he threw every obstacle in my way and did all in his power to create difficulty and distrust between the president and myself. I soon found it impossible to gain access to him. Before he was in office, he constantly ran after me and professed the most ardent friendship. As soon as I became, as soon as he became Secretary of War, his whole manner changed, and I could no longer find the opportunity to transact even the ordinary current business of the office with him. It is now very clear to me that far from being as he had always represented himself to me in direct and violent opposition to the radicals, he was really in secret alliance with them and that he and they were alike unwilling that I should be successful. No other theory can possibly account for his and their course and on the theory everything becomes clear and easily explained. So there's McClellan at the end of this concluding that, of course, McClellan's lack of success wasn't his fault. It was because Stanton was part of some radical cabal of Republicans who were out to get him. Now, let me take you to the second half of this video where McClellan talks about Lincoln. Now, let's get right into it. This is a combination of also two passages that I've connected together. So here we go. My relations with Mr. Lincoln were generally very pleasant, and I seldom had trouble with him when we could meet face to face. The difficulty always arose behind my back. I believe that he liked me personally, and certainly he was always much influenced by me when we were together. During the early part of my command in Washington, he often consulted with me before taking important steps or appointing general officers. I'm going to pause you for just a moment here because at this point, McClellan goes into about a page and a half rant giving examples of General David Hunter and Joe Hooker in both situations, how Lincoln uh, a apparently went to McClellan for advice about appointing Hunter and Hooker to commands. And McClellan was sort of like, well, I'm not really sure you want to do that. And then McClellan comes to find out that Lincoln, quote unquote, went behind his back and appointed them anyway. So here's the second part. Officially, my association with the president was very close until the severe attack of illness in December 1861. Now, pause here. McClellan is talking about a pretty serious case of typhoid that he experienced in December 1861 that kept him out of action for quite a while. McClellan continues. I was often sent for to attend formal and informal cabinet meetings. And at all hours, whenever the president desired to consult with me on any subject, and he often came to my house frequently late at night to learn the last news before retiring. His fame as a narrator of anecdotes was fully deserved, and he always had something apropos on the spur of the moment. Late one night, when he was at my house, I received a telegram from an officer commanding a regiment on the Upper Potomac. The dispatch related some very desperate fighting that had been done during the day, describing in magniloquent terms the severe nature of the contest, fierce bayonet charges, etc., and terminated with a very small list of killed and wounded, quite out of proportion with his description of the struggle. The president quietly listened to my reading of the telegram and then said that it reminded him of a notorious liar who attained such a reputation as an exaggerator that he finally instructed his servant to stop him when his tongue was running too rapidly by pulling his coat or touching his feet. One day, the master was relating wonders he had seen in Europe and describing a building which was about a mile long and a half mile high. 
just then, the servant's heel came down on the narrator's toes, and he stopped abruptly. One of the listeners asked how broad this remarkable building might be. The narrator modestly replied, about a foot. I think, this is McClellan, I think he enjoyed these things quite as much as his listeners. McClellan, ha, ha, ha. Anecdotes. McClellan goes on to describe another anecdote that I hadn't heard before. He says he met Lincoln in Illinois before the war. You may recall McClellan was involved in the railroads. So here's the anecdote. Long before the war, when vice president of the Illinois Central Railroad Company, I knew Mr. Lincoln, for he was one of the counsel of the company. More than once I have been with him in out-of-the-way county seats where some important case was being tried and, in the lack of sleeping accommodations, have spent the night in front of a stove listening to the unceasing flow of anecdotes from his lips. He was never at a loss, and I could never quite make up my mind how many of them he had really heard before and how many he invented on the spur of the moment. His stories were seldom refined, but were always to the point. So there you have it. A couple of anecdotes from George B. McClellan, Major General of the Army of the Potomac in 1861 and 1862, discussing his encounters and anecdotes with President Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin B. Stanton. Take care. See you on the next episode.